What's your biggest success story? My biggest success story was probably the property that I did in uh, in Kissimmee, Florida. It was it was awful, man. Like just the, the everything was just terrible about the property. It was in the middle of renovation. Hi, this is Ted Kelly with another Ted's Hospitality Minute. Hey, today we've got an awesome guest on. His name is Bruce Jordan. He is the MJ of the hotel industry. He's going to come on, talk a little bit about what he does over there at Hotel Guest Management. Also, I'd like to make a specific note that he is a author. He is a top 25 social media influence in the hospitality industry. He is a hotel revenue expert. This guy's got more designations than I know about. But he's going to come on and share with us a little bit about what's going on in the industry from his perspective and some of the services that he provides over at Hotel Guest Management. Bruce, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a privilege to have you, sir. I just want to say that I'm a big fan of yours. I see a lot of the podcasts that you put out and uh, it's all good stuff. I love watching and I love uh I love the guests that you have on. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, I've been, when you first started, I think I was like your first subscriber on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> well, see there, that, that's a little known black history fact right there. I didn't know that. Right. So I, I got to make sure I make a note of that. But uh, but Bruce, before we dive in, I always like to give our viewers, our audience, uh, a little bit of uh, background on our guests and give them an opportunity to talk a little bit about, you know, how they got to the hospitality space that they're in, because we find that more times than not, a lot of the people in the hospitality space didn't originally plan to be there. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I actually started off, uh, I was like 17 years old. I started off in the in the bail bond industry. Uh, I was a call agent, and then I worked my way up to bondsman. Then I worked my way up to bounty hunter when I was about eighteen years old. And after doing that for uh, after my first couple of captures, I said, you know, this may not be for me. And, you know, it's it was it was literally a rough crowd. <laughs> so I had to, <laughs> so I said, I I, I got to do something else. I end up um, getting a, a position in accounting department at Tosco, which is an oil refinery in New Jersey, where I'm from. And um, they had a massive layoff about a year later, and I, I landed myself in a tip position at a Hyatt in New Jersey doing accounts payables. And within one year, I was uh, the chief accountant at the department, had worked my way up. And um, now I was overseeing like the whole accounting department, overseeing six employees, including pur purchasing. So Wow, that is so interesting. So you actually jumped through a few different industries before you landed in the hospitality space. Absolutely. I, I was a, I hit management when I was about 20 years old. So we'll have these company parties and I couldn't even drink. <laughs> we'll have these company management parties. I couldn't take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Now, tell our audience a little bit about what you do. What are your services? What do you provide for prospective hotel uh, hotelers? What we do is we turn around failing properties, so failing and underperforming properties. So, you know, I, I get a, a project uh, that goes across my desk and the uh, the investor, the owner say, this is a great project for you, which usually means it's a great project for them. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll see if it's even worth it uh, or I'll probably say, hey, you don't want to get into this one. This is going to take a little too long to, to turn around. But I get a couple of good projects across my desk. And we go in there, we do our thing. I have a, I have a, like an elite Navy SEAL team. Like our, our, our team go in there and we'll knock it out in, in a year or so. And next thing you know, you know, they'll either sell it or they'll do a cash out refi or something of that nature by the time we're finished. So. Wow. Wow. Now, what, what's been some of the, or should I say, what's been one of the toughest challenges you've had with trying to, to get into a certain hotel or and try to turn around? Most of the challenges that I do have is um, working with the franchises. Um, like you have to, you have to be a Jedi, you know, a lot of Jedi mind tricks and go through Jedi trials just to get something changed on the website. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it's it's tough, man. Like I, I have to submit like three or four tickets just to get a picture change. It's it's weird. It's really really weird. 
but yeah, that's that's some of my biggest challenges is 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 um dealing with some of the 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 loops that you have to go through and the hoops that you have to jump through to to get things done with the franchise. Yeah, and they are they so so typically you're dealing with a franchise or branded type property. Is the ownership like? Is it like a large ownership group or is it like a single owner or is it like a small owner? Typically what what it varies. Some of some of our clients that have 20, 30 hotels, other clients they have three or four and they got they got the, they got a bad deal or they're looking into getting into a deal. You know, the ones that they they got a bad deal, you know, you just gotta be honest with them. Like this is this is not gonna be overnight. And the ones that are looking to get into a good deal, that's the best position to be in because you really know what you're getting yourself into before you sign on the dotted line. Right. So they can they can use your services to help you come in and kind of evaluate the real profitability of the, the hotel before saying, yes, I do. Yeah, I, I get like 20 P&Ls a week. <laughs> 20 P&Ls a week. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? <laughs> I'm like, I think this place needs a new elevator. <laughs> the elevator expense is fifty percent of the PL. <laughs> and which and which in which you know and I know because that's the space that we play in. Elevators are not cheap. <laughs> yeah. And then we have like two brand of elevators. I won't say their names. They're like the Mercedes Benz elevator. You should never get those elevators, no matter what. <laughs> yeah, Ele- e- elevators are not cheap, and it takes a long time to get the parts. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Like, and, and you're gonna so, be down, a- and then the state could just come in and shut you down. Like, it- there's just no way, no way. That's right, that's right. Hey, hey, Bruce. Before I go on, let me let me uh, give a shout out to my sponsor, or they won't sponsor me anymore. I need them. Uh, THM viewers, this episode is being sponsored by Recover It. If you've experienced a home fire, tornado, or other natural disaster, you know how easy it is to lose everything overnight. Well, Recover is a new app that allows you to record everything in your home, store it in the clouds for easy retrieval should disaster strike. This app saves you time from trying to recall all of your household valuables, jewelry, heirlooms, and allows you to settle your claim with your insurance company a lot faster. Check out the Recover It app today. And if you use the promo code on the screen, you get 50% off. And as always, we love to get your feedback on this episode here with Bruce. We're on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and please subscribe to our LinkedIn channel and our YouTube channel as well. And we always appreciate your feedback and your thoughts on every segment. So, Bruce, tell me this. So you've got all types of inquiries or requests coming in each week. Say, hey, Bruce, we need to do this. How do you decide which ones are the ones you want to work on? Well, one, I, I only do a handful. There's some There's some I could just say, you know, you don't really need my management services. I'll be a consultant on this project. And, you know, this way it'll save you money and it'll save, it'll save you a lot of time. Uh, others, I really have to get knee deep and uh, say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and take this management project. But I have to be finishing up with the management project before I can take another one. So while one is on the way out, another one is on the way in. Okay. Okay. Now, now I'm going to change, change topics a little bit, but not much. Now, you're a published author, right? So tell us about, the, tell us about this book that you wrote and this what book, made you write it. This book is called The Hotel Revenue Bible. The one thing that <laughs> made me write this book is I got tired of beating everybody. Like, it was just too busy. It was too easy beating these people. So <laughs> what I realized is that everybody knew everything about operations and cutting expenses. They were like expense junkies. Like they 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 knew every single expense they could cut. As soon as you get on the subject of revenue, everybody was all over the place. They had no clue. So you 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 were like you would go talk to a sales and marketing director. She knew everything about sales, nothing about marketing. I asked her like different things. Hey, what's the frequency on this pose? Um, what's the impression rate? Like, what's your reach? They're like, huh? It was just a deer in the head like that. No idea what I was talking about. I'll go to revenue management. Revenue management had not had no idea how to control their listing, what should be in it. They had no idea how to uh, submit posts to gain more demand and get better reach. Like they, you know, to get the rates out there. They, they just, they just have, didn't have a clue. So I would come in and I was literally just mop the floor with these hotels 
and they will try to figure out what I'm doing. So I said, you know, instead of figuring out what I'm doing, how about I just tell you? Just, just, just go grab the book. And <laughs> go grab the book, and then you can see what I'm doing. It makes things a lot easier for the both of us. You know, so that's why I wrote the book, because I see that everybody was too dark uh, departmentalized, and they wasn't really understanding what was going on in each department. So they didn't know how to feed each other. They didn't know how to work together. So now everybody knows how to hold everybody accountable with this particular book because everybody knows each other's job. And it's all the greatest tips and tricks that I use to turn around properties. Yeah. Wow. That is that is so interesting. And I think you and I were chatting. And you said that there's really not a book out there that talks about how to really improve your hotel revenue. It, it the, focuses the book, on it. Yeah. The books out there is like it focuses on revenue management or it focuses on sales. Or folks on right, social right. media, like there's nothing a whole book that has everything together. So, well, I, I gotta, uh, I gotta pick that up and see if I can learn something uh, from the uh, the almighty uh, Yoda of the uh, <laughs> of the hotel space. Um, and, <laughs> and I'll have to get it autographed somehow because you know that's a special piece to have you on the podcast talking about your book. So I gotta figure out a way to get it autographed as well. But um, but but tell me a little bit about this. Now, you, in addition to your, uh, should I say your day job, you are quite a social media podcaster, influencer, all of the above. What what made you want to do that? It actually started as a mistake. Uh, I uh, I shot my competition. So I would stay at the hotels. Um, figure out ways I can I can tweak my hotel to uh, to gain that business and and you know just take a little bit more business away from them and um, I was doing that I was shopping my competition staying inside the hotels nobody knew how who I was I would go in there and say man I know you got the, a lot of parking lots a lot of cars in the parking lot what groups are here and the front desk agent would just tell me <laughs> what groups they had. And then I didn't know the rate, so I will call down and say, hey, um, uh, what rate does this company have? And the front desk would just tell me. So I was uh, doing my thing, and my wife just happened to be with me. And she's like, you're crazy. I'm like, this is how I get my information. She's like, you know what we should do? We should, re we should record this. And, and that's how it all started. My wife said, we should record this. And, and that's how the series Hotel Management Do's and Don'ts started. I would just go in a hotel see what they're doing right, see what they're doing wrong, find out their flaws, pretty much what I do on a regular basis and capitalize, figure out how to capitalize on their flaws. So, and now we're on season four. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so, so it's been four years of heavy duty, you know, going in as a guest and really soliciting and seeing what all, <laughs> what all they're doing and saying, hey, this is how you can improve that. And then now you got a book that kind of captures everything uh, in a nice little one one place. You can get everything that that uh, the MJ of the hotel industry knows. Exactly. <laughs> At least ninety percent of it. I saved ten percent just in case I get too smart. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you gotta save something, right? So they gotta come to you. <laughs> you you got, I got to keep something so they got to come back and see you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so tell me this. What's been what's been your biggest success story with the client that you've gone in and, and helped turn around or increase their hotel revenue? What What's your biggest success story? My biggest success story was probably the property that I did in uh, in Kissimmee, Florida. It was it was awful, man. Like just. The, the everything was just terrible about the property. It was in the middle of renovation. Um, they were losing money hand over fist. There was there was conflict between the investors because of all the money that was being lost. There's just so many issues that you, that you have to deal with the staffing issues. Um, the 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 owner of that particular property he had no idea what he was doing. He didn't know revenue management. He thought because he was a great stockbroker that meant he's a uh, uh, an instant revenue manager <laughs> on, on command. Oh, yeah. You know, just, just different things that, that there's so many issues that property had that, you know, getting rid of people that, you know, the bad guests that dealt the drugs and the prostitution, get rid of them. 
processing all those evictions. I had to become an attorney overnight because I had to process all those evictions just to get them out of there. Like it was, it was just awful. It was awful. So to take a property that did sixty thousand to you know almost four hundred thousand about four hundred thousand dollars a month in in less than six months was was incredible. Wow, that's impressive, man. That's impressive. So do you find that you run into a lot of situations where you've got relatively new owners that are you know, now want to be hotelers and think they know it all and kind of No, what what happens is the, the owners they buy a hotel and they believe they can defy gravity, you know. So they'll get a hotel and they're like, Oh, I got this hundred and two hundred thousand dollar reserve money. I don't need this, I could buy a couple new cars and now the hotel doesn't have any reserves and something goes wrong and I have to do what I have to do to make it happen because I know I can't rely on them. You, you know what I mean? I, uh, my the last hotel that I'm, I'm, I'm about to get off my portfolio is almost cycling itself out. All there is, there was no reserve. There's no nothing. So everything that was done to that hotel was through revenue. It was just, it was just fortunate that the revenues doubled. So it didn't take its toll on me. So. Right. Now, because we play in the PIP renovation space and the maintenance capex space, are hotelers good about setting aside those capex reserves for taking care of the, you know, rainy day maintenance or emergency stuff or planning for the actual PIP? Do they do a good job with that? Most most experienced hotel owners do, and most experienced hotel investors do. Um, the new ones believe that they could just pray and it will happen by itself. <laughs> so you have to, you have to, <laughs> you have to be mindful of, of what's going on and, and, and what you're doing, especially, you know, nowadays it's difficult to find like it's GMs with, with maintenance experience. So a lot of people don't know I actually have maintenance experience. So I'll run into those maintenance men that say, I can't fix this. And I say, let me show you how. You know, and they know how to fix it, but they believe they say that they can't fix it. You know, they they're gonna they're gonna get away from from actually having to fix it. So they run when you get those GMs that don't know, they're that's when you're in trouble. Or you know, the, you know how subcontractors subcontractors are. They'll try to they'll try to rob the hell out of you. You know, you, you'll get the bid. And like, what is this? Separate the material and labor. You know, I I need to see this breakdown because. I could build a whole new hotel with this bid. <laughs> wow. But well, what, be, what really be, yeah. is those sprinkler systems, man, those sprinkler systems, I swear. I think I need yeah. to get into that business. That That is a, a gold mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that it's a gold mine. I do know that um, when, Pip, when uh, COVID came into play, it pretty much shut down everything and the renovation and the maintenance cap, nobody was doing anything. So, you know, we're coming through that now. The brands are demanding that the pips get done. So now all of a sudden you've got this, you know, a lot of energy, right? And people trying to figure out what to do for pips. But to some of the guys that don't do a good job of setting aside the reserves, I think they plan to go to the bank and borrow money, right? So now the issue is the interest rates are high. So, what they could have got back in the day you're at three percent four percent now it's seven or eight percent so it's like uh you know now they're in another pinch so it's like okay i gotta do the pit i can't go borrow the money i don't want to spend my money so it's like what do you do right so it's like it's, it's a it's an interesting phenomenon but we are seeing we are seeing a lot more uh interest on the pip side and you're absolutely right on the maintenance cap side because a lot of I say small ownership groups and kind of an indirect effect of COVID is that the industry lost a lot of real skilled maintenance building engineering type guys. And the guys that we see in hotel spaces now that are building engineers, you know, may not have been a building engineer six months ago. They might have been a shade tree, <laughs> you know, they might have been a, a shade tree mechanic. They might have been you know, driving the van at the airport or something like that, but they're not necessarily, <laughs> but, but they're not, not necessarily building engineers. And so what we figured out is that, Hey, 
a lot of these smaller ownership groups that have building engineers that can't really solve problems is that we try to figure out a way to say, hey, if you need help with that, you can just, you know, we can give you a certain number of hours to help your building engineer actually do a better job evaluating what he has before you start calling out contractors. Because to your point, contractors going to come out, they're going to look at what you asked them to look at, and they're going to say, hey, here's what it costs to fix that. And they're not trying to give you a break. And they're not trying to help you understand what you ought to do to make it work the best way. They're just like, yeah, that's probably the most expensive setup. So let me give them that that solution. Hey, so you're correct. You're, correct. you're absolutely right there. You're I had a drive right. valve go bad, and um, the drive valve cost two thousand dollars. The cheapest bid I could find was nine grand. I'm like, this is a this is a one day project. Like, what are you going to have twenty guys out here to change the drive valve? It's it's five screws. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's. It's uh, it, for guys that don't know, you know, and for ownership groups that don't know. And if you add a GM that doesn't know, you know, you got the triple whammy, you know, because uh, you can get taken to the house pretty fast and, uh, you know, may, may not even get them to come back after they've taken your money. So, oh, yeah, that's that's <laughs> roofers are famous for that. They, they never come back ever. <laughs> But, but man, that is that is awesome, man. So tell me this: Are there any 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 upcoming events or anything like that that you want our audience to know about? That's going to be you know you know airing on your upcoming podcast, or you know you got another book that's coming out, or anything we need to put out there? Well, I I just got finished uh, doing some interviews at Hoa, so I I just launched a, a, a Hotel Insider podcast. With um, Ganare, uh, Gar- um, with the chief commercial officer Sinesta, um, she was great. She was great. She was talking about hotel rewards programs. Um, I got an, a couple more coming up with um, Studio Six, with Six uh, Motel Six, and Studio Six uh, with uh, Rip Hotel. He he's pretty good. and uh, I got one coming up with uh, uh, with Paramount, which is uh, Omari Head. The hotel broker, oh. uh, he's really sharp. Amari is really. Oh sharp. man, I, I tell you what, I've seen and I've received a lot of his um, emails about things that he has out on the market. Man, he he's a busy guy. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, and now I see why. <laughs> After interviews, I see why he's so busy. Right. So, well, good man. Well I, well, I tell you what, Bruce. Thanks so much for. Uh, coming on the THM and giving us a few minutes of your time. You know, I love talking sports. And when I saw, you know, I'm the MJ of the hospitality uh, industry, I'm like, oh, we got to talk to this guy because he's a hoopster, right? So <laughs> who did you, let me ask this question. Who did you have in the finals, uh, Connecticut or Purdue? I think I'm going to go with Purdue. Well, Connecticut won. <laughs> <laughs> They, they won. <laughs> they won. It. Purdue always does it. I don't. I don't. I don't know what happened, but I. I had Purdue. You know, like. Hey. Yeah. No. And uh, and my bracket got busted a long time ago. I think. Uh, who was it that busted it up? I can't remember. But uh, but yeah, it was a. It was a good. It was a good NCAA basketball season. I think the women's basketball is just taking off right now. I mean, you know, Caitlin and. And Angel Reese and, you know, what Don Staley has done over at USC, I just think she's done a phenomenal job. And I just, you know, kudos to her and and what she accomplished this year with with her women's team because they're they're awesome. I just I love watching them play because they're, they're really more fun. Well, and I don't want to say this as to slight the men, but they're actually more fun to watch than the men's team at USC. So. They take for me anyway. I, I feel like they take more chances. They they, they get more yeah. rebounds for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're not scared to be underneath the hoop, okay? I don't know what's going on with, with these men out here. They're scared to get rebounds. They're scared to be under hoop. They don't want to break a nail. I don't I don't, I don't. <laughs> these women out here getting it done, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but Bruce, thank you again for your time today. It's been informative. I have enjoyed it thoroughly and uh you know, I look for, forward to catching up with you again. Maybe we'll have you back in uh, a couple of months or something after you made some other major breakthrough and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> for sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs>
This has been another Ted's Hospitality Minute. We'd like to remind our viewers, please follow us on LinkedIn, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you can catch this episode with Bruce and others on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. And as always, 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 we appreciate your thoughts and feedback on every episode. Please check out the Recover It app. Remember today, if you click on the promo code, you get 50% off by using that, dis that discount code that we've got on the screen. Thanks again for joining us. Ted's Hospitality Minute is sponsored by Recover It. Don't wait for disaster to happen to wish you had done this.